crystal crown procedure. Mm -hmm. Where do I start? Well, the first thing I would suggest is review the instructions when you listen to the first act again. Mm -hmm. Because at the end I say that you're likely to need several passes through to bring it to life the first time. Mm -hmm. okay. This does not lend itself to a visual anything. How do you visualize intention? These are abstractions, not concrete. Right. Okay. So what they're doing is invoking your integrity with regard to those words. Mm -hmm. okay. the, the more integrity a person has, the more they inverse, invest those words with actual experience, not just mental definitions. And in that case, they call up responses in a person appropriate to the word, and the sequences uh, put those abstractions, those factors, into relationship with each other. And the rhythms help drive in or activate each of those factors where they're otherwise either largely unconscious or faintly existent for a person. <clears throat> I, I understand that. So the reason for my lack of enthusiasm about walking you through is that there's really nothing different about what I would do in person than what you would get from the recording. The, all the structures are there and the rhythms are there. Well, uh, in, the, in the recording you say, uh, like, imagine, imagine change, imagining, changing, and so on and so forth. Right. The only way I, I've been doing that is with uh, either visual or by imagining myself doing something. And that's not the instruction. The instruction is take what you get and don't filter for correctness. You just take what you get. Well, maybe I didn't put that instruction into Act 1. I, I thought I did, but maybe I didn't from the expression on your face. Yeah, but it seems like it's wrong. what I'm getting is wrong. That's filtering for correctness. Mm -hmm. You just take what you get and you do, move on. You do each step as given and you take what you get. There's a point at which the instructions penetrate to a sufficient depth in you that you get uh, a somatic response to them. And this is not a matter of correctness. It's more like a Rorschach test where you get some sort of a stimulus and whatever comes up is the information that was needed. So I can see how this would run very much counter to your training, your engineering training, for example. Mm -hmm. Well, it runs counter to the way I think in general. Exactly. 180 degrees counter to the typical way Westerners process information, which is memory-based. Mm -hmm. Correctness, because the educational system mm -hmm. is rewarding correctness and punishing incorrectness. So all of that training is a, 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 a snare and an entrapment that's mm -hmm. built into Western civilization. That's why mm -hmm. those procedures exist, in order to counter the counterproductive training of so-called education and Western civilization. But it's like a Rorschach test. You take what you get because what you get is what was in there. And what we're doing is bringing these things, subconsciousness, into consciousness. These are not corrections. You see? These are awakenings. And, <laughs> and, they, and they show a person what they're made of to themselves. They unveil the person's own hidden underpinnings of the way they operate. And I can see how this would be problematic just from the, the way you ask, how's that, with frequency, and I keep returning you to your own experience. I, I don't trust my own senses most of the time. Exactly, and that's the fallacy of Western 
educational training. The whole thing, Western civilization has become uh, corrupted. <laughs> the civilization is falling exactly because people don't trust their own perceptions. That's where authoritarians, authoritarianism steps in because people don't trust their own intelligence. <clears throat> the thing is, my, my sensory... Uh... My sensory feelings are so screwed up, how could I trust them? Right, that's the whole conditioning of uh, contemporary culture. Don't trust your feelings. That's what gets us in deep doo-doo. That's why we've got a fool for a president and fools in Congress, because <laughs> he took the position of being an authority and all the dimwits elected him because they didn't trust their own intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's how it happens. So I think I've said before, somatic education is a subversive teaching. And what it subverts people into is trusting their own intelligence instead of that of external authority. You notice mm -hmm. that I relinquish the position of authority as quickly as I can. I'm putting... I, I, I noticed that. See, so what I'm doing is turning a person once again to their own emerging intelligence. And I think I've also said Tom Hanna was a red-blooded American subversive, a Texan <laughs> from Waco, right? <clears throat> right. And an academic who was uh, chairman of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Florida at Gainesville during the Summer of Love, the 60s. And he was the person that the students were coming to because he was not the establishment even though he was chairman of that department. He talked hmm. about authentic human freedom to us. One of his first books was Explorers of Humankind. The reason he got interested in the human potential movement was because of his passionate fervor for authentic human freedom. So you <laughs> see, he was... Yeah, if you were to listen to some of his teachings, it was all that. It was all that. It was the opposite. It was not external authority telling a person what to feel, what to think. It was getting a person to examine their own makeup. So this is Tiger by the Tail for Mr. Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what about the uh, intelligent empowerment stuff? That's all what it's about. That's what it's it said, all about. Uh, it said that's from uh, personal coaching. From? I don't follow. It said that uh, on your blog, it said uh, that's from personal coaching. Yeah, I don't understand the from part. Uh, the, that it was, let's see if I can put this. That it, I assume that to mean that it uh, has to, you have to teach it directly. Oh, well, the, to get a person started, mm -hmm. very often it's helpful. I didn't have an, anyone to turn to. And a bunches of people who do this do it by themselves because it works. And most of the time when I've taken people through a gold key release the first time, I haven't elaborated anything. It's been plain vanilla, just the steps, and it works for them. So, yeah, my mind doesn't really work like that. Well, that's why it's useful to do that procedure, so that you can boot yourself up. <coughs> that's what this yeah. is, is a boot, it's a booting up process. It's uh, actually what it is, is an upgrade to the human operating system. A an big, upgrade. A big upgrade. Because it, it uh, you've heard of artificial intelligence. Well, this is organic intelligence or organismic mm -hmm. or somatic intelligence. That's a better word, somatic intelligence. You notice that these words are neutral as can be. When I say attention, it's neutral. Intention, neutral. Memory, neutral. Imagination, mm -hmm. neutral. Because these terms are essentially empty of value and meaning. What they are is... Um, pigeonholes or hooks 
on which experience hangs, so to speak. And those four don't bias experience in any direction except higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. Which is nothing more than turning on the essential somatic faculties, attention, intention, memory, and imagination. Every living creature operates with those, down to viruses. How do we know? Because viruses gravitate to a nucleus to fuss with the, the genetic material. Mm -hmm. There is an intelligence and a draw even in the most primitive life forms. So what we're doing is a somatic awakening. And if a person doesn't operate that way, no surprise to me, I've seen what this culture is made of. And it's in danger for the, that very reason. Mm -hmm. We could get away with it for a long time before things became uh, critically potent enough to wreck human civilization from the actions of a handful of individuals, which is where we are, obviously. So Tom Hanna was a red-blooded American subversive. <laughs> and I am, you could call me, a red-blooded planetary subversive. Mm -hmm. now his, his teaching was certainly a world teaching, a world-level teaching. The only limitation is translating into different languages. But I am in his lineage, not because I decided to conform to his lineage, but because I have the same orientation. In fact, I said I had a conversation with him about this during break one time. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is unrecorded anywhere, but it was during a break. And I said, you know, Dr. Hannah, I was the only one who called him that. Everyone else called him Tom. I said, you and I have... A number of things in common and he said what and I says well we're both somatically interested in somatic development we're both innovative we're both uh, original thinkers and I said and we're both very opinionated and he grinned when he heard me tell him we're both very opinionated. Mm -hmm. okay, there's a fifth, I don't remember it offhand, but you get the gist of it. Oh, yeah. You know, we both were writing on these subjects. You know, we're both very creative in that area. So it's not that I <laughs> conformed myself to him. I intuited that he had a missing piece that I didn't have. But when time came for him to deliver training, this was all very familiar territory to me. And what he did was just highlight some things that I had not yet arrived at. So mm -hmm. this is, at once it is subversive teaching, but it's also authentically in the sense of uh, American freedom. It's an authentic teaching because we are talking about authentic freedom. The freedom to awaken, to be self <coughs> to be self-correcting, self-regulating, and to be authentic, which is what uh, being the author of one's own process is about. Authentic mm -hmm. and author go together. Self-authoring. And what that really means is it's not that it's just that we are arbitrarily coming up with stuff, but that we are choosing on the basis of native intelligence what to go with. We are not buying what the authorities say. He even told us on more than one occasion, he said, never accept a diagnosis when a client comes to you. Never accept a diagnosis from another medical practitioner. Always find out for yourself. So these procedures, they just happened to have taken things rather deeper than he did. He was into in, in or his training with us, clinical somatic education. Although the first day that we, he delivered training, he said to us, this is not a course in body work. God forbid. His words exactly. Mm. It was, that's an application of it. But this was not what he was fundamentally teaching us. He was teaching us to surface what is subconscious and to recover control over what was involuntary. The emergence of intelligence. If artificial intelligence went that way, it would be safe. Okay. So that's why uh, 
I, and how I developed these procedures. They emerged in me spontaneously. Once on the basis of having heard someone online, a teacher, say something, just one sentence, and that was sufficient to set me on the course of developing one of the procedures, the middle way memory matrix. What's that? <laughs> well, it's, it's one of the tetraseed procedures that pairs two items against each other and by contrasting them to each other and synergizing them with each other alternately reveals the hidden dynamics of any of those two and it could be positive or negative, it could be two very similar things. It's highly applicable to uncovering the sources of dilemma or confusion in a person and clarifying these things without lending any bias whatsoever. All it does is contrast intending and refusing and the two items against each other. And by that, combining them in positive and negative combinations immensely reveals subconscious conditioning and by so doing liberates us from that conditioning. It really does boost intelligence tremendously. I called it the middle way memory matrix because the middle way in Buddhism is not moderation. That's a Western concept. Mm -hmm. The middle way is what you get when you include all extremes without adhering to any of them. And what that does, that feels like a middle way of balance. So it's termed in Buddhism the middle way. Memory matrix is because it's flushing up subconscious memories and it does so in a matrix structure, not the matrix where Neo was, you know, <laughs> emerging. It's been 20 years since that was released. <laughs> yeah, and it really hasn't made its point. Why? Because people didn't have the means of putting it into effective action. The Tetris scene. And the last started. one was terrible. What is it? The last movie in that trilogy was pretty bad. Oh, it's terrible. You mean the one with all the octopus aliens? Yeah. Yeah, that yep. was kind of, you know, that's what happens when they substitute CGI for plot. Yep. But, you know, they, they had a lot in there that was valid, but no way other than perhaps idealistic aspiration of putting what was in those movies into practice. Turns mm -hmm. out the Tetris procedures exactly do that. They bust you out of the matrix. It's and the red pill. <laughs> and what it does then is opens the way for creative intelligence to emerge. And you've seen plenty of that it, from me, right? It's not because mm -hmm. I have a, a tremendous... Uh, genius personality or ego or something is that I put to, into practice these procedures and my own process has been emerging and developing ever since I started and more and more creative work is coming to the fore now to the point where I can't keep up with the creative output mm -hmm. so that's what I'm offering to other people I'm, I'm giving it away the, the gold key release is the liberation procedure and the crystal crown procedure the second one is the activation of intelligence procedure and there so are could, go ahead could you do a quick walk through just so i have an idea of what's happening yeah and if i can you know i'll tell you what I, what i'm experiencing and uh you'll see if i'm on the right path or if i need a little course correction oh we're back to that again <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. I don't mind. The thing is, uh, the need for self, for course correction from others is self-limiting. Uh -huh. these, these procedures are self-teaching. If you just okay. do them as given, because nobody, where did I get it? I ran the procedures, and the procedures showed me their ins and outs. All The only thing I did was discern the integrity of structure to these procedures, and then apply them. And they showed me, showed me and showed me. They are self-teaching. Mm -hmm. So sure, I'll take you through Act 1, for starters. 
you, you won't really get a lot of advantage from being in person with me other than the feeling of your attention being boosted by my attention. Right. That, that you will get. <clears throat> that, is, that is something I've noticed and uh, it's definitely worth, uh, it's definitely a factor mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in my experience. Sure. Yeah, it, it's been observed before, although I rankle against it because I'm really not about dependency relationships. I'm about having people wake up their own empowerment and take over. I call this lighting the pilot light. I'm not quite there yet. Well, that's what I you understand what you mean. Oh, you are, because you've made plenty of discoveries in these action patterns by yourself without my telling you. So it's already active in you. What isn't active is you haven't taken on your self-doubt and dissolved that. So it's... Uh, See, I tried to dissolve it. I tried. But every time I do something wrong and make myself feel worse, it comes back. That's perfect. So what you do is you take what comes back, and that's what you run through. Because this conditioning exists in, we could call it layers. It, there are... Uh, surface or most superficial low-hanging fruit and in many cases that's all there is and it goes and it's done but as you this is the rabbit hole this is a rabbit hole you go down this rabbit hole you start discerning the underpinnings of your own consciousness mm -hmm. your own, that is your own egoic attention <laughs> you start discerning all of that and you realize you keep catching yourself at things and rather than invalidating yourself for these things, which you recognize as errors, you go, hot diggity, here's another one that looks really interesting. And you put that through the procedures. That's how you approach it. But, you know, it's maybe in the beginning, you're not used to that. And you're, not, you're used to being punished for errors rather than having them treated as, oh boy, this one looks really interesting. Hmm. This pathology of mine looks really interesting what will happen when I run that through the procedure? Very interesting. Very interesting. Because the procedures are so reliable that you can develop a degree, this is what I was getting at, of confidence in yourself and in the procedures that you know, even if you discover some really you know, dark, crippling crap in yourself, and I have discovered plenty of that in myself, <laughs> it isn't an end point. It's junior to the potency of these procedures. When you get far enough along, you'll be getting stuff that is uh, really difficult to work with without preparation, such as a crystal crown procedure beforehand and after, because the stuff is so much a part of your identity, most of which is unconscious that to turn and face it, you experience it as being very elusive. There are some things I would rather not face in myself. Yeah, sure. I understand that. It's fear of finding yourself out. I had that too. And what <laughs> you do with that fear is you run it through the procedure. Then the fear loses its charge. Then you go after the thing you were afraid to look at, which is now has been had its teeth pulled for the most part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Then you go after it for its structure, and it reveals itself to you, and you discover that it's not you. It's something, a pattern of conditioning that you've had. It's not you as a self. It's just a pattern of conditioning to which you've been subject without any sense of control or sufficient consciousness to manage it because the four factors of intelligence have been unevenly developed or in some cases largely offline and that's what keeps humans in trouble when it's offline or out of balance and poorly integrated with the others you feel out of control and you are mm -hmm. and that's what makes this culture so pathetically trapped in the stupidities of the times and as I wrote in that article about memory you remember that one uh -huh. It's because people are going by memory. They're going what? They're living by memory. They see a situation and they resort to memory. Well, what do I do about this kind of situation? 
Uh -huh. Their incoming channel, the imagination channel, has been cut off. Has been cut off by the dominance of memory. I I, I consider myself fairly creative mm -hmm. in some in certain aspects. Yes, in some <laughs> aspects. <clears throat> It's difficult. You know, I have had my difficulties in areas, too, even up to recently. Certain mm -hmm. ones, uh, uh, a certain one with a woman's name. <laughs> okay? And, you know, it's like you, just, you discover your deep underpinnings, and then you go after them. Why? Because if you don't, you'll just suffer. As God intended. Maggots and all. <laughs> According to which religion, you know. These are perversions of the religions by followers who did not have the realization of the central figures. Mm -hmm. And so they become corrupted. This is the way uh, Paul uh, wrecked the teaching of Jesus, or Yeshua, which was his name. Mm -hmm. Yeshua ben Judah was his name, not Jesus Christ. That's a Christian. That's a Westernized, uh, Latinized. Yeah, that's right. And it's been it's been <laughs> a subversion of his teaching. Boy, is it ever subverted! How a uh, boy just it is just up subverted up the wazoo right now. So what I'm doing, you know, with the best of intentions and high diligence, is providing means for people, rather than to oppose these. <coughs> corrupted teachings, because opposition doesn't work, it just keeps you ensnared, is to dissolve the bondage of these teachings. And dissolution is a release. That's what the gold key release is about, why it's called a release. It doesn't land us in the correct alternative. It doesn't land us in the correct alternative. It dissolves both alternatives. <coughs> Hmm. Then spontaneous intelligence comes to the fore because the, the memory block of alternatives has been dissolved and the imagination channel has been equalized with the memory channel. Uh, I wanted to ask also, yeah. you yeah. said uh, Western, you're talking about Western civilization. Mm -hmm. Do you think, has there ever been a civilization that wasn't? Hopelessly materialistic. <clears throat> well, Indian civilization, that's become that as it's gotten westernized. But prior to that, it was not. It was the reverse. Instead well, of well, what, was it the reverse or is that just the way we perceive it over oh, a thousand yeah. years? And, you know, the only people who were literate at that time were uh, <clears throat> the ones who were spiritual. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. Uh, the reason I say it's opposite, and this is not my personal insight, it was this is something I learned from another Western master, was that the Western civilization is intent on perfecting, perfecting technology, perfecting lifestyle, perfecting economic status, everything perfecting. Mm -hmm. the, East, the Eastern orientation is to transcendence, not perfection. They see the world as a domain of suffering, and they want to get out of it. And so the, the Buddhist teaching is of getting off the wheel of rebirth. Okay. So they are alternatives. One is perfecting it, and thereby avoiding suffering. The other is transcending it, but, and so avoiding suffering. Mm -hmm. Although the word transcendence has gotten banged up in usage. The, the real nature of transcendence is, again, the dissolution of being stuck with alternatives. It's not avoidance. It's not escape. Real transcendence at yeah. once is liberated from the involuntary alternatives and fully capable of functioning mm -hmm. in the area in which those alternatives pertain. So it's a whole different orientation. What I have done with the Tetra Seed procedures, because they were given to me, is an <laughs> integration of both. These procedures at once liberate us from the binding alternatives and <laughs> make us fully capable of operating. 
as you can tell, I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, what's the word, incompetent or helpless. No. Okay. There's a certain quality that's arisen in me over time, which has a certain force to it, is obvious. Uh, I expect one of my later upcoming uh, developments will be to soften that. Mm -hmm. Okay. But right now, that's my current adaptation. What I'm giving is given with intent and a measure of intelligence. And these procedures were way instrumental in my developing along those lines. And I am fully confident that anybody who uses them will undergo a similar awakening. So uh, <clears throat> can, can you walk me through part one of the uh, Crystal Crown? Yeah, let's do. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. By way of preparation, I'm going to do a little exercise with you about the four factors of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I'll take you through Act 1 of the Crystal Crown Procedure. So we'll start with the four factors of intelligence. The first one I'll use with you is imagining. Mm -hmm. So right now, deliberately imagine something and make a nonverbal indication when you've done it. Does it matter what it is? No. It can be anything, any idea, concept, or object. Right. Anything with a, a defined aspect. Even if it's absurd. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You're just imagining. You're exercising <laughs> imagination. <laughs> okay. Let me see. Okay. Now imagine <laughs> now imagine something else. Okay. So you've had an experience of imagining something. So now intend something. Doesn't mean you have to do it, just intend it right now. Okay, great. Now get the feeling of intending something else. Okay, now we do remembering. Deliberately remember something. When I try and remember something, it it's more than one thing. It's a sequence of things. Yeah, that's all remembering, so that's <laughs> fine. Let's do it a little differently. Look at something in the room and then close your eyes. Now remember what you looked at. Okay, now choose something else. Look at it. Close your eyes and remember it. Fine. Now let's go to attending. Attending is the act of placing attention. Mm -hmm. So choose something, anything in your environment and attend to it. Oh, what do you mean by that? No, I just say choose anything in your environment and attend to it. Put your attention, place your attention on it. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Now choose something else and place your attention on it. Attend to it. Okay, let's go back to imagining now. What I'd like you to do is intend to imagine something. Intend to imagine something. Yeah. That's it right there. Even before the thing surfaces, you're intending to imagine it. <laughs> okay. I kind of see what you mean, but it, it's strange. It's like, it's kind of dim, like it's a subconscious. Yeah, see, you just said back to me what I said earlier. <laughs> okay, so let's show you something interesting about that. So if you imagine intending something, 
Mm -hmm. Do that. Imagine intending something. For, for me, it feels like <clears throat> it's, you know, the, um, the junction between when you get a thought and when you want to act on it. Mm -hmm. That's right. That feels like that's what it is. is there that... you go. That's right. Okay. See, I'm just showing you your native intelligence. I'm just pointing your uh, attention into your underpinnings. Now, let's take, now let's take remembering. <laughs> the first step would be intend remembering something. Even if I can't remember what it is? That's right. It's just the intending. Let me give you a little clue. You've been frustrated in your life. <laughs> Many times. As okay, have everyone. <laughs> right. So frustration is the feeling of intending. <laughs> you won't feel frustrating unless you intended it and it didn't happen. Okay. I see. I got it. Okay. Now remember intending something. Got it. Okay. Now let's go to attending and remembering. Remember attending to something. Got it. Now attend to remembering something. Got it. Okay. Now you notice that those pairs synergize. <laughs> hey. Looky, compare remembering something to attending to remembering something. The attention occurs before the memory, well, actually, before, the, the, before you want to remember. Well, before the memory surfaces, mm -hmm. but before the memory surfaces, you're already attending to remembering. You're just waiting for the individual memory to come up. Mm -hmm. See, these all synergize, and that's true of all four. They are synergistic. All they do is mutually reinforce their own nature with each other. So I've given you a taste. There's a video that I'll send you which goes at this complete elaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, uh, one of the first forms of the setup procedure. There's a, I'm going to retitle this one. But it uh, turns on the faculties and shows you experientially what each one feels like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you may it's notice... A very fast... This happens very quickly at a subconscious level and it's generally not noticed. If, well, sometimes it doesn't happen quickly at all. It's way slow. And it's where you can't put your finger on something, where you can't understand something, where you can't comprehend what you're seeing. It's, it, it, when it's functioning, it, well, it functions very quickly and it is subconscious. Mm -hmm. But it can be impeded, can be impaired, and that slows things down quite a bit or cripples them completely. So that's why the combinations are they, as they are in the Crystal Crown procedure. When I do mul multiple repetitions, such as, oh, imagine changing, changing. The mind goes, doing. How do you imagine changing, changing? Because it has no content. But it does have a feeling. <laughs> and because it's subconscious and it's not surfaced, the extra, the second statement, reinforces it. So it surfaces it more quickly. So imagine, so the second changing reinforces the first. You aren't imagine changing something that is changing in and of itself. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's where I was a bit confused. Well, if you, if you go on faith with the instructions and just take what you get, all this 
understanding emerges spontaneously. Let's, uh, let, let's try the other one now, because imagining has two facets. I call it a process and a product. Process is changing. The product mm -hmm. is appearance. Imagining mm -hmm. always involves an appearance of some sort. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine appearance appearing, mm -hmm. you see, it helps you go down the rabbit hole. And then the combination is imagine changing appearance. Imagine changing appearance. So, well, thinking of that, I thought of, you know, a, a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. Very, that's very legitimate. simple. Yeah, that's very. right. That happens to be a tangible example. Now, you could try this. Imagine appearance changing. I'm thinking of a bunch of different things okay. at the same time. They all fall under that category. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. It happens that everything you can possibly identify falls into that category. No exceptions. There's something that doesn't change. Well, in fact, your attention upon it, your experience of it is changing. A moment ago, you didn't have your attention on it. Now you do. That's a changing experience. Hmm. Even things that appear to be stuck and not changing exist in the domain of change. They're just changing really slowly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all four of those factors has its complementary pairings, we have the subjective, which is, in this case, let's say, intention. And the counterparts of that are activity and existing. Intenting, intending always involves an activity. And it always involves existing. And it involves uh, memory as well. Uh, yes, that's right, it does. <laughs> and in fact, everything involves all four. But mysteriously, we're able to focus on those four factors and b highlight them without having to highlight all four at once. But when you all highlight all four at once, uh, something very unusual happens. I don't think I want to tell you what that is because in practice it will reveal itself to you and I don't want to burden your conceptual mind with something that's incomprehensible. Okay. Through, through concepts. But if we're doing intending activity existing, right? <laughs> How about intending existing activity? Huh. Now, I'm thinking of the same thing in both cases. That's right. But it's a different flavor when you go activity existing that shows that's more of a process orientation whereas mm -hmm. if you're intending an existing activity that's a product that already exists mm -hmm. order makes a difference right now likewise with remembering i have to the, the counterparts for remembering are integrity persisting integrity persisting and I'm using integrity in the technical sense we the term structural integrity illustrates that something holds together in functions <laughs> and that's its integrity it's not honesty and truthfulness sense of a, a low order understanding the pure understanding of integrity is wholeness so if you have remembering integrity persisting, there it is. Every memory has a, is an identifiable something that persists. <laughs> we flip it over and say remembering persisting integrity.
Yes. Okay. Order makes a difference. And in particular, in a process like this, a procedure like this, doing it in a different order helps flush up stuff that's hidden. It refreshes attention and it gets at things that don't surface the other way, even though it's the same triad. Mm. <laughs> now we have the last one, which is attending. And attending is the act of placing attention. And the triad is attending, locating, location. That's the process. We go the product, we go attending to location, locating. You've already got the location, now you're locating it. <laughs> okay? Order makes a difference. So these triads are the subjective, the process, and the product. The subjective is, you might call it the one doing the experiencing. The process is what it takes to get the experience. And the product is what's experienced. <clears throat> and they always operate as a triad. You can't have them without all three. It's just that if you do a different order, one of them remains latent until you bring it to the surface. <laughs> your, your, your attention to it is is subconscious. That's what I mean by latent, not non-functional, but subconscious. So the crystal crown procedure, the first step, the, the first act, is to turn on all three of each factor, subjective, process, and product. Mm -hmm. The second act is to, is to link the four subjective aspects, imagining, intending, remembering, attending. Could you repeat that again, please? Imagining, intending, remembering, attending. Got it. Then we go to the process uh, foursome, and that is changing activity, integrity, locating. What do you mean by integrity here? Wholeness. Something that's a whole unit. So a very simple example would be finding an Easter egg. That's right. That's locating an integrity. An Easter egg is a something. Mm -hmm. It has integrity and you're locating it. That's so it. it's like tangible. That's, well, it could be, not have to be tangible. You could locate an emotion. Where do you feel it in you? Feel it everywhere. Okay, depending. You know, sorrow has a characteristic location. A what? Sorrow has a characteristic location in a person. Really? It's, yeah, it's generally the heart region and the frontal part of the person. Mm -hmm. Anger is in the spine, actually the region of the solar plexus, roughly. And it may also involve jaw clenching. These are, you know, uh, I've oversimplified by saying it just has that position. A lot of things happen with any mm -hmm. emotion. Fear, likewise, that's it. These are just start, uh, the basic reflexes of stress. Fear is suppressed breathing, tight front of the chest, tight belly, head down and forward, has a sensation to it as a location. Mm -hmm. So subjective or tangible, uh, intangible or objective, tangible, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Anything, anything, anything. So the product foursome is appearance, existing, persisting location.
Got it. See? So there's integrity all throughout in every possible combination. But like a Rorschach test, as you go through the procedure, sometimes nothing will appear to surface. Uh -huh. But the instruction is don't you filter for correctness. You just take what you get and move on. Because sometimes there ain't nothing there. There's nothing that needs to be flushed up. And I, I can pause the video. That's right. That's right. You can pause it any time, get a result, and restart it. So that's why this is structured the way it is. Now, other procedures have a completely different structure, but the same basic elements. Mm -hmm. Their underpinnings are the same. They're all working with the four factors of intelligence, but they're applied in different rhythms, different orders, or they may be operative in following an instruction. I'm not, I'm not going into the other procedures because you, it, it's only useful with experience and this would just clutter things. Mm -hmm. But the crucial thing is to take whatever comes up and recognize that that is how you've been operating unconsciously. That's all. <laughs> and as you run through the procedure the first time, maybe it'll produce a vivid experience at some of the steps, or maybe not, so what? You're not used to surfacing these primal factors of intelligence. You're not used to it. As you said, they're operating subconsciously, <laughs> generally faster than a person can notice because they're interested in the product or the outcome, not in the process. I see. see? So what we're doing is taking what is subterranean, and we're bringing it up to the light of day. As soon as you do that, you've increased your measure of freedom for that. Many <laughs> things occur during a crystal crown procedure, but because they are inherent and because the procedure is self-teaching, I don't need to talk about them. You just do it and all this will teach you its own nature. So it's okay if the things I think of under uh, time constraints are fairly simple examples, right? Uh, yeah, in the beginning you're just learning the lay of the land here. <clears throat> it's, then I suggest people take on moderately difficult issues, not easy ones. The, mm -hmm. moderate, the moderate ones have more mass to them. They're easier to get a handle on. <laughs> if you do something too difficult at the beginning, you may get your attention stuck <laughs> in, the, in the process. And you can certainly get yourself unstuck, but someone who's new at this doesn't have the facility to feel confident. And so they may go, oh my God, I did something wrong and now I'm stuck instead of just running the process as given. Because it will lead outside. It will lead through itself to the outside <laughs> space. I see. So these procedures, as far as I can tell, teach everything that any other teaching teaches. Like, for example, what I just said now teaches faith. Just run the process by itself without knowing in advance. You just run it. That teaches faith. If you run the process as given to the end, it teaches you diligence. It also teaches patience. It teaches integrity. It teaches all of the virtues. Everything you could possibly conceive of as a virtue is brought to life in these procedures because they are the underpinnings of all virtues. They're also the underpinnings of all vices. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you what I heard, this person said that triggered my developing the middle way memory matrix. She said that of virtues and vices, virtues are the more trapping. They'll trap you mm -hmm. because vices you look at askance, you go, oh, this is a vice, and you kind of are worried about it. Whereas virtues go unquestioned. 
And so a person who's hung up on being virtuous is hung up. They are trapped by their commitment to being virtuous. They have no capacity, they have a limited uh, flexibility. So this teaches equanimity, it teaches transcendence, <clears throat> it teaches freedom from entrapment by virtue or vice. So again, it's a self-teaching process. You do this and you'll go, wow! It, and when, when something surfaces, you get rid of it with gold key release, right? No, I guess I'll tell you one of the hidden secrets. The mere act of turning on all four faculties, all four <laughs> factors, causes sometimes disappearance or dissolution of the bind just by bringing the weak ones online. It produces liberation just by bringing all four online and integrating them. You don't have to do a second step. However, at the end of such a procedure, there may be something left over. You're now no longer unconscious about it. You know it's there now, but you feel a bit stuck with it. That's when you can run a gold key release. And a gold key release is very commonly the polish up finishing action. If there's anything left over, even if it looks like a great idea and it's virtuous, if, you're, if you've understood where these procedures lead, you go, you know what, I'm not going to be trapped by the virtue either. You dissolve that too. That leaves you with free intelligence, free intelligence. And that leaves you fully capable of functioning in that area of life better than before. Even though you've dissolved it, now, <laughs> now the abilities come up spontaneously to meet the need of the moment. It's okay. Say in the in Buddhism, there's a term spontaneous right action, and this isn't spontaneous self justification. It's spontaneous action that's better fitting the situation, that produces a more satisfactory result than you could have tried to get before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, knowing that in advance isn't useful. What's useful is you run the procedure and notice, by George, this problematic area of life has shifted. So this, is, this is back to authentic human freedom. It's not conformity to correctness or to memory or to knowledge. It's transcendence of conformity, transcendence of memory, transcendence of knowledge. It puts a person into a disposition of a kind of receptivity. And the receptivity is the receptivity of imagining changing appearance. First thing you do as soon as you imagine changing appearance is you go receptive. The mouth is open. The imagination, although it's a very nice Walt Disney term, uh -huh. is actually, I like to call it the mouth opening to the mystery of experience. It's the interface to mystery. Now, when something emerges from mystery in the form of imagination, it may consolidate into a memory. That's how you capture good ideas. If you don't capture the good idea when it surfaces, what happens to the idea? If you don't remember the idea? Yeah, if you don't capture it in memory, what happens to the idea? Uh, it dissolves. Precisely. It goes back into mystery. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this teaches metaphysics. Okay, but also teaches physics. The double slit experiment. Yeah, I remember that. Right? What are they doing? They're directing attention. Now, an, uh, an artificial device can't direct attention. It can mm -hmm. only be fed 
information. Right. But living beings, because we are present as imagination and the other three, we have an unpredictability factor. So quantum computing is along those lines. Quantum computing is operating in the same lines as the double slit experiment, exactly the same lines. <clears throat> it's taking entangled particles with a certain, in a certain scenario, and by virtue of the tendencies present in human intention, which is what's going to pose a problem for a quantum computer to solve, human attention does that it creates a field of influence. It takes what was merely a wave function consisting of all possibility and it doesn't, they call it collapse and I don't like the term collapsing wave function. It consolidates the wave function mm -hmm. into, a part, into a particular experience. Yeah, it forces it to go through one slit or the other. Exactly. So even physics, the double slit experiment, is within the domain of the four factors that I've been outlining. They are senior. Those four factors are transcendental and they are imminent or tangible. They are the, the wormhole between the heart of a black hole, which is utterly unknown, it, it seems like uh, with this uh, technique, it's similar to how in a somatic mo movement, when you're about to start a movement, you have to notice what muscles are tensing up and if anything else is tensing up unnecessarily. Yeah, that's and right. It's you to notice that uh, critical juncture. It seems like there's a parallel. Is that clear? That's right. That's right. That's right. Somatic education involves attention, intention, memory, and imagination. In a hands-on pandiculation, the attention part is what you just described. The, feeling. <laughs> the intention part is the movement. Uh -huh. The memory part is the sensory motor amnesia that keeps you locked up. Mm -hmm. And the imagination part is converting an instruction into an action. You have to imagine what the words of instruction mean to do the action. All four are operative in clinical somatic education. They're operative in everything, but in clinical somatic education it's easier to talk about. Okay. So that's the, the kind of, that's the, the walkthrough, the overview that you wouldn't have gotten from listening to the recording. I've had you explore those native faculties that are always operating in you. Mm -hmm. But at a subconscious level, mm -hmm. more or less. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, uh, do you recommend doing tongue mudra afterwards? It's very useful when you have a bit of proficiency, not at first, because that's a division of your attention. Okay. Okay, but... Uh, I commonly use tongue mudra doing gold key release because the release part, the end of that procedure, is accelerated by tongue mudra. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, that reminds me. You said you uh, you said dragon's breath was the next um, next step in all of the tongue mudra. Yeah, that's, that's right. It's a way of applying the four faculties of intelligence. I, I normally would ask, would have asked you at another time, but since I've been sitting in this chair, my uh, SI joint has been acting up and I'm beginning to feel stuff. Well, I'd say get into movement. Get into movement. That's all. Just get into movement. Walk. Change your activity. That's the problem that people get when they sit too long as they set up like jello. They're no longer like liquid. They are now fixated. So you just get active. But it, once I finish this, once I get rid of this SI joint pain, once, once they're working symmetrically, I won't have this issue, right? You, well, you might be uncomfortable from sitting too long, as anybody would. 
It's not healthy to be immobile at a high level of concentration for long periods. That's what I call the formula for contraction. Yeah. yeah. Motion is the order of life. If you spend too much time restricted in your motion, you're going to become habituated into that tension pattern. I see. <laughs> so, uh, just one, one more thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You say uh, um, there are four aspects to uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, um, could there be a fifth or a sixth or a seventh? You know? Well, no, the four are fundamental and sufficient. However, they can be colored by intention or, or by refusal. Refusal and intention are a dynamic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> intention and refusal are both intentions. Refusal is an intention. So everything is derivative from those four. They don't need anything more. They are complete. And they underlie all other variations and possibilities, as I indicated just now with refusal and intention. I, I mention it because I remember reading about uh, a mathematician who was trying to uh, figure out how to get complex numbers to work in three dimensions. And he was having so much trouble, and, to, and he was trying to use three numbers, three different numbers, and then when he figured out a fourth number, it all to add a fourth one, it all clicked. Yeah, well, that's because there are four. Four is the, the minimum unit of structure. Uh, what, what do you mean? Anything that exists in space must have, at minimum, four points of reference. Oh, yeah, like that. I see. Okay. Now, the thing about complex numbers in three is actually not three, but four dimensions. Mm -hmm. Nothing exists in three dimensions. Everything exists minimum four. Well, so in, I, in theory, you know, you've got your zero, one, two, three, and four dimensions, and then you have higher dimensions. <laughs> uh, these are these are tricks of language. First of all, zero and one are the same. They're both the minimum something. They exist as a unity. If you ha you can't have a one. Without a zero. Without a zero. And you can't have a zero without the zero being one zero. Well, that's one way to think of it. Well, all you try to do is try to conceive, conceive of a zero without some one zero being there. What a contrast. That's right. One and zero are the minimum needed for contrast. And I think that actually one and zero indicate the nature of the quantum foam. Mm -hmm. The quantum foam is an asynchronous oscillation between one and zero where zero is not a something it's actually the empty set mm -hmm. one divided by zero incomprehensible the unknown unknown you can tell i'm kind of leading into another rabbit hole here mm -hmm. and i kind of don't want to do that right now but i can understand that it's been an hour or so yeah but, but, uh, thank you so much we'll have to go through that rabbit hole another time and I'll send you a link to that basic setup procedure. I just happened to come across it in my YouTube video cleanup process mm -hmm. uh, yesterday. And so I'll locate it and send it to you. And it'll take you through the basic training in the four factors or faculties of intelligence. Mm -hmm. As far as I can see, there are no exceptions. And I have yet to see any teaching that has something this doesn't. Anything from psychology to physics. I have yet to see an exception. I just keep on discovering, my gosh, this even covers that. It does seem to be a fundamental structure of reality that bridges the unknown unknown or the fundamental mystery existence, which is... Why is there even a universe to begin with? Mm -hmm. Right? And it, it is a, a bridge that reconciles the mystery of existence with all of the tangibles, not even tangible, all the conditionings of existence. It seems to be the meeting place between existence and absolute mystery. 
I know it's a mouthful, but that's certainly the way it seems to me. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> well, as, as you probably guessed, I have an extremely good analytical mind. So whenever I hear something, I always have to analyze it and run it through for logic, you know? Well, these procedures incorporate that totally. The very act of going through the Crystal Crown procedure can be seen as a thoroughgoing analysis of the structure of reality. Okay. But you'll well, see for yourself. Well, you know what? I'll go and I'll, I'll read what you send me and I'll try it myself. So thank you. Okay. Uh, see what I can get from it and report are your, it. Are your wires heating up? Is the insulation starting to smoke? <laughs> hmm. No, no. No, okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> no, no, fortunately not. All right. All right, I'll locate that video and send you the link.